Hi, Nathan Cole here, and we are talking vibrato today and an actual device that I can recommend to help train your vibrato. So uh, let's let's loosen things up. Start start with a little Sibelius concerto opening. So much easier without the accompaniment. I don't have to count all those eighth notes. I should still be counting them. So can a device actually help you improve your vibrato? I say yes. There's something I use every day. Um, actually going to set this down. We're not going to need it again for a while. Hope that's not a disappointment, but I want to get to the training bits. Um, the link to buy the thing I'm talking about, um, and it's it's not very expensive. That's in the description. It'll take you to Amazon. Now I did make another vibri vibrato, another video about vibrato, uh, called flexible, effortless violin vibrato. And in that video, I borrow a lot of great ideas from uh, the teacher Simon Fisher. I go over kind of his method for um, training. But I've since learned that a lot of folks have trouble getting started with those vibrato motions or figuring out how to apply them. And if that's true or for any reason, you just want to improve that vibrato, uh, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, what we're going to do is strengthen parts of the fingers, you know, get pumped. Actually, the, the fingers technically don't have any muscles in them. I'm, I'm an old guy and I only recently learned that. So we're not really going to, you know, build up the muscles of the fingers because there's no such thing. But it is still possible to train the motion of the joints of the fingers, and that's what we need to do. Really, this is crucial for a uh, beautiful vibrato, and you can easily see it in videos of Heifetz, for example, the way that his finger joints work. If you haven't thought about those joints ever or in a while, it's time. <laughs> you know, if you look at your hand, well, I guess you're looking at my hand at this point. Look at yours, too. There are three joints, right, to every finger. And uh, to, for your thumb, I actually, if I ever knew the names of all those joints, I've forgotten them. But the last one, that, that one that's closest to the fingernail, that's the one we're really concerned with today. Um, and that is called the distor interphalangeal joint. I do love saying that. We're going to come back to that one later. Let's look at what happens if all three of these finger joints stay aligned right? What am I doing? I'm just bending at this base knuckle here. I said we weren't going to need this, but what happens if I play like that? Could I just bend right there, keep the finger absolutely straight? Of, of course not. <laughs> if you can even make that happen, um, you can quickly see that you can never play the violin that way. But at least I wanted to show it. That's with, uh, you know, neither neither of these two junctions bending. It's ridiculous, right? So we learn early on to have a curve to the fingers, right? Gives us strength, lets us uh, find the right places on the strings and all of that. So notice that there are two angles we're dealing with now, right? There's an angle right there that's somewhat close to 90 degrees, maybe not exactly 90, but close enough. And then there's this one. And, you know, I love that to be in the neighborhood of 45 degrees, something like that. Um, many of you may have, or at least may have seen, a, a so-called collapsing pinky, right? And that's where you, if you put any pressure on that fourth finger, it wants to collapse. Um, now, <laughs> after training, the fourth finger on my left hand won't do that anymore, but on my, my right hand, I bet it will. Um, so that looks like this, right? I'm putting pressure on that pinky. And now see how the top of it is totally straight. Okay, so this junction here is not bending. That's straight, but I've still got an angle there. <laughs> so if you've got a collapsing pinky, whether you know it or not, you are somehow manipulating the way those, those joints work. That's something you can train. I actually made a whole video 
about that called pinky power but honestly stay right here because the device and the method we're going to use in this video will also help you with that so i keep taking i keep teasing this this device um slip that back in the pocket for now we'll get to it what is vibrato really um <laughs> because we got to understand that if we want to be able to work on it of course it's a modulation of the pitch right goes above and below the center of the note heresy i know i know there's some controversy about that but uh trust me it goes goes a little above and a little below the note um there's only one part of the body that touches the string right so if you think about it, we know that only that tip of the finger can change the pitch. Um, so somehow that fingertip has to move. Now, how is it going to move? It's not going to slide up and down the string, is it, right? Like for that beginning of Sibelius. Uh, no, again, ridiculous. Although I think I've heard some folks use that vibrato from time to time. Um, that's not what we want. So <laughs> it's not sliding. Of course, it is rolling, right? Rolling that fingertip. Now, how can that be done? Stay with me. I'm going to start with, once again, a, a fairly ridiculous example. Um, but we're going to go from the ridiculous to the sublime. Um, and this will show also how silly some of that terminology is, you know, arm vibrato, wrist vibrato, uh, hand vibrato, finger vibrato, I don't know, elbow, is there an elbow vibrato? Um, I don't really like those terms. Let's start with what it would look like if I only tried to vibrate with the arm, but I'm not going to allow the shape of the finger to change at all. How could I even do that? I would, to, to move the whole thing, right? As a unit, I'd have to the arm would kind of have to go up and down or rock side to side somehow. That would roll the fingertip. Uh, if you see somebody vibrating like that, run the other direction or give them, give them like a clarinet, some instrument that doesn't vibrate. Um, what about just bending the wrist? But again, keeping that finger still. Let me switch to a second finger. Um, actually, let me do a first finger. It's probably easier to see. So could I do that? I could. My wrist is kind of going in and out and I'm able to roll that fingertip without the shape of the finger changing at all. Again, that looks terrible because it is terrible. Um, <laughs> don't do that. Not that I think you would, but we're, we're getting, getting closer, right? To the true solution. What about if the whole finger sort of curled and uncurled curl uncurl curled and uncurled now you can see that both of those two angles that i was talking about earlier those angles are now both changing okay so all the joints are moving in other words so now i'm getting a roll so that's pretty good But that's kind of a lot of motion, right? I've got somehow that hand has to move further from the neck and closer for that to happen, right? So so we're getting closer, but that's not very efficient. Is there some way to get this more efficient? There's really only one possibility left, isn't it? And it's once again that, can I say it again? The distal interphalangeal joint. Um, so if just that moves, really, that's what that looks like. And you can clearly see this joint in, you know, pull up any video of Heifetz, take a close look at his left hand, especially if the angle is good. You, you're going to see that joint wiggling like mad. So you need flexibility in that last joint, but you need it even if this first joint is firm. So what do I mean by that? We call this, sometimes it's called the pencil test. I've got a Sharpie, so I guess today it's the Sharpie test. If you hold 
a pencil or your Sharpie. In the crook right there, this joint, right the one closest to the palm, is going to be firm. That's set in place. But that DIP joint can be flexible. You could even sort of wiggle it, wiggle it around, right? Okay, you can do that with... I'm trying to do this while hiding the other fingers. There we go, second finger, third, fourth. We'll take what we can get. My four doesn't quite work the same way and yours very well might not either. So let's not worry about that for the moment. So that's kind of a prerequisite, um, but the device and the method going over today, that'll help with that too if you can't do that yet. But that is not quite good enough because you need that flexibility even while the finger is under pressure. And I'm not talking about, um, you know, just pressure as in stress. I mean, actual downward finger pressure. So there are some folks who can do, you know, that wiggling stuff for the last joint. But then as soon as the finger goes down, as it must to stop a note on the violin, the joint is suddenly rock hard and it won't move. Um, that will never do for a proper vibrato. So enter the device. I'm going to exchange my Sharpie for one of these. This is a Grip Master. It's a, from a company called Pro Hands. Um, and what it's got is four independent springs here on the top. Uh, I guess there are three on the bottom to balance these out. But that means that each of your four fingers can get its own spring. Now, we're not going to use this to strengthen our grip, even though it's called the Grip Master. Uh, a lot of times golfers or tennis players or even weightlifters might use a device like this for that reason. Um, and it's not to get our fingers to be able to press harder either. Uh, a lot of violinists press their fingers too hard as it is. Um, and we're not going to ruin our hands <laughs> like Schumann was uh, reputed to have done with, with some springy device that he concocted. All we're going to do is gain control of this last joint this last junction here distal interphalangeal joint gotta love saying that um we need control of it over the entire range of motion by which i mean we need to be able to go smoothly from this shape down let's take it all the way past straight huh and back totally smoothly even if i've got the spring pressed down Okay. Is it smooth? Now, I got a few specifics with this. You won't be surprised to learn. Um, first of all, I want to leave the thumb out of this as much as possible. I don't be holding this. I don't want to be holding this between the thumb and the finger like this, because I don't really want to train my hand to squeeze between the thumb and the fingers. So I like holding it about like this. Of course, the thumb is involved, but, but not this part of the thumb, at least. Um, that's just how I like to do this. Um, I'm going to show you the first finger with no pressure on it at all. Okay, I'm not pressing down the spring at all. You can see it from this angle. Okay, it's down and up. The entire range of motion is smooth. Okay, couple things here. I want this to be relatively neutral. If you find that you've got this angle, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> A little bit in this direction may be okay, but basically close to neutral. I also don't want any big, you know, reaches to get to the springs. Um, you know, something close to how you might play the violin, all right? Now, if your finger wants to pop down, like if you get it part way down and then boom, it collapses all the way like that with no tension on the spring, then you got to go slower. See if you can identify the place where it wants to do that. Um, if it wants to pop up, you're, you're here and you're on your way up and boom, it wants to go all the way, then what I do is... 
I use a finger on the other hand and I push down a little bit on that joint to help out, to give a little resistance, to prevent it from popping all the way up. So I help out. On the way down, I don't need help. I do that on my own. On the way up, I just press down a little bit. And I really want to work that middle range, the range where it feels likely to want to pop up. And that's it. Um, with each finger then, you start gradually depressing the spring, put a little pressure on it, and then same process. Is it smooth all the way down? Is it smooth all the way up? Most people find the first finger the easiest. So you move on to the second finger. Same process, I won't put you through all of that. When you start getting to the third and especially the fourth, that's where many people find either this doesn't work at all or they need more help from that other hand, and that's what this is all about. You want to start with the really light tension version of these. Um, for myself, I started with, a, and the colors may change depending, so I don't want to name colors necessarily, but um, at least when I bought it, uh, blue was light tension, and that's where I started. They, they have, I think, even two lighter than light. I think they have an extra light and a 2x light or something like that. You start somewhere. I recommend getting two of these so that you can move up. I have the, the light and the medium. Um, with four, okay, uh, no worries if it's really slow going. Uh, not everyone can really isolate that last, that DIP joint with the fourth finger. Um, it may only work for you, um, as it often does for me, if the third finger is involved as well, and that's fine. Um, any work you can do on the fourth finger will help the fourth finger vibrato. See, look, I got my bad angle there. One more thing to watch for when you're doing these, if you see this device going back and forth like that, then you're, you're not doing it right. Um, and why is that? Because when we vibrate, we don't want the neck moving around or the hand moving around, right? So if this is starting straight up and down, that's how you want it to stay. Only that joint moves. So if you're getting, if you're doing it by doing this, then right keep that still. Um, and then you work your way all the way to bottoming out the spring, basically. Um, so if you can press the spring all the way down with the first finger, for example, and still, that's a lot of pressure, and still get that smooth through the whole range of motion, then you move to the next color up, although I, past medium, I'm not sure that you're really doing any good because you're never going to put quite that much pressure on the violin. So as I said, I would get two, um, either light and medium or maybe extra light and light with the, the thought of perhaps moving up to medium after that. So if that's feeling good, I generally do this as part of my warm up. It's maybe three minutes in a day and it's nice. I can do, you know, even before I unpack the instrument, I can just grab this. It's so compact do a few minutes. So how's the vibrato doing after all that? From another angle, maybe we'll do a little of that Sibelius opening again. This is the slow version. So you can see that joint flexing, and that is a key component of the vibrato. Now, how to initiate that motion? Well, that's the subject for another video. 
and in fact, in some ways, I've made that video. It's the one I mentioned earlier about the flexible, effortless violin vibrato. That's all about getting the whole works moving in different ways. But that last joint is key to it all. So if you've tried that and struggled, hopefully this will help. And, you know, give it some time. I would expect that you can see a real difference inside of a week. And after a month, things could be really different for you, particularly if you didn't have that ability before. So that last joint and training it is really key to it all. So again, the link to get that, uh, the Pro Hands devices is in the description that takes you to Amazon. Also including a link to download my practice essentials guide, which covers so many more subjects than vibrato. That's free for you. So that link also is in the description. If you do try this workout, let me know how it works for you. I'm uh, really curious to see if it helped you as much as it did me. I will see you next time. And if you want to get alerts about when the next video comes out, just hit that subscribe button. See you soon.